to God. Because of His blessing and mercy, we can come together without any obstacle on to this event with healthy condition. In the International Lecture Series, Chemical Innovation for a Sustainable Future in the Series 4 about electrochemical process to convert carbon dioxide to valuable products like syngas and fuels. Before we come into the main session, let us pray first so the event that we will hold on this day will run well. Pray based on individual beliefs begins. Then, to Honorable Professor Thomas Rawford as a speaker, to Honorable Dr. Insinyur Trinwa Yuhardianto, STMT, as Dean of Engineering Faculty, University of Jember, to Honorable Insinyur Boy Arifari, STMT, PhD, as Head of Chemical Engineering Department, Engineering Faculty, University of Jember, to Honorable Rector from Chemical Engineering Department, Engineering Faculty, University of Jember, and to all Honorable Distinguished Guests. Ladies and gentlemen, on this next occasion, let me convey the rundown of the event today as follows. Opening, Singing Indonesia Raya, the opening speech from Dr. Insinyur Triwayu Hardianto, STMT, or Insinyur Boy Arifahari, STMT, PhD. The International Lecture Series, Chemical Innovation for a Sustainable Future in Series 4 about electrochemical process to convert carbon dioxide to valuable products like syngas and fuels which will deliver to Professor Thomas Rafford. Discussion or the question as for session, closing. Ladies and gentlemen, let's start this event by singing National Anthem of Indonesia, Indonesia Raya. All of guests are expected to prepare. Thank you for all guests. Ladies and gentlemen, now we invite Insinyur Boy Arifahari STMT PhD for the opening speech. To, to Insinyur Boy Arifahari STMT PhD, please welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank to each and every one of you who already enjoy and follow our program for the very first time and uh, until today uh, we perform the international series and for today uh, Professor Tom Kofot from the University of uh, Dallas uh, will give uh, lecture about the electrochemical processes to convert CO2 to, to valuable products like a syngas and fuel. Uh, yeah, uh, good morning, Professor Tom. 
Good morning, everyone. Yeah, uh, yeah. I really appreciate it that you will share your knowledge about the uh, chemical processes. And yeah, uh, the topic is in line with our uh, with our uh, study program. It's also with our university who focus on the uh, <coughs> green engineering technology and uh, and to provide a uh, uh, clean gas from uh, to convert CO2 to valuable product like clean gas and fuel. As we already know that uh, fuel are important uh, things for the developing country like Indonesia, but also uh, for the whole all around the world. And uh, I believe that uh, the, your lecture will will improve and will improve our knowledge and our information about the uh, about the uh, electrochemical processes producing gas and uh, fuel. I also would like to appreciate it to the International Office of Universal Chamber who support us, who support us to perform this inter international lecture series. And I also appreciate it to the whole team, uh, especially for uh, Dr. Handra Sitrajat who lead the program uh, from the very this time is the first international lecture series until uh, today, the support of the international lecture series. And I also uh, thank you for all the participants to our students uh, uh, from the uh, first semester until the of, uh, Seven semester, I think. Uh, and this lecture is uh, will uh, uh, surely improve your knowledge and will give you a benefit and will enrich your uh, <coughs> your your skill in chemical engineering processes. And uh, this is all our uh, my uh, short point speech. And again, our uh, uh, I like to say I enjoyed the, the lecture and uh, please find the insights about the uh, electrochemical processes. And uh, to my students, if you have uh, any question, don't hesitate to uh, discuss to uh, Professor uh, Tom Rupert. Uh, he is an expert, I believe, uh, and uh, uh, yeah, uh, enjoy and have fun with the lecture series. And yeah, I think that's all uh, my opening speech. Now back to uh, Master of Ceremony, Nishan. The speech delivered by Insignia by Ari Fahari, SMT, PhD. Thank you for your speech. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, now we are coming into the main point of this event, the International Lecture Series, Chemical Innovation for a Sustainable Future in Series 4, about electrochemical process to convert carbon dioxide to valuable products like syngas and fuels, which will be guided by Mr. Hangare Surat Sudrajat's PhD. To Mr. Hangare Sudrajat's PhD as moderator, please welcome. Uh, thank you, Mizan. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming today in our international lecture series, Chemical Innovation for a Sustainable Future. I'm Hangar Strachat from the Department of Chemical Engineering, uh, Universal Chamber. I'm the moderator of this uh, international lecture series. Uh, let me briefly introduce our honorable guest lecturer, uh, Professor Tom Rafford. Tom, Tom is an associate professor, also chief investigator at the Center for Natural Gas at the University of Queensland in Australia. He completed his PhD in chemical engineering at the University of Queensland. He has been uh, performing research on gas uh, processing, uh, purification for uh, energy production and uh, utilization. Uh, his research interests include electrochemical processes, including energy storage and carbon dioxide reduction and uh, natural gas uh, process engineering. 
So today he will share his insights on electrochemical processes to convert carbon dioxide to uh, valuable products like uh, chin glass and fuels. So, um, Professor Tom Rafuts, uh, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, uh, for inviting me to speak. Um, I hope you can see my slide now on the screen. Perfect. Uh, yeah, we can clearly see. So thank you. It's my pleasure to be able to meet some people uh, from the University of Jemba. I think one of the upsides of the COVID pandemic is that we've had the opportunity to do things like this a little bit differently in research and academia. Uh, so we can make better use of technology to connect with each other uh, rather than having to travel a long distance. Um, yeah. So thank you for, for welcoming me today. And I'll share a little bit about my knowledge in uh, CO2 conversion and a little bit about my home institute, the University of Queensland. Hopefully someday in the future, some of us will get to meet each other in person um, and, and when the world returns to something more normal. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, uh, <laughs> I'm going to start because I am standing on uh, the ground in Australia with an acknowledgement of country. So this is an acknowledgement of the traditional owners of the country in which we sit in Australia. And when we say country in this space, we mean the land on which we sit or stand. So the University of Queensland acknowledges the traditional owners and their custodianship on the lands on which we meet. Uh, we pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. And we recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. So my presentation today will start with a little bit of introduction to the University of Queensland to give you an idea of, uh, you know, where we're placed in the world, the types of work we do, um, and that will help you to understand um, some of the research we do, but also to think about opportunities to connect in the future. And then I'll talk about electrochemical carbon dioxide conversion, starting with a general overview before moving on to talking about a specific research project we work on to modify a catalyst surface to make it more selective or more active as well for uh, the conversions that we want to do. So here's a map of Australia and we're sitting in Brisbane. I'm just gonna get my uh, annotation, my spotlight on so I can point to the screen. So we're sitting here in Brisbane, the University of Queensland on Australia's east coast. We're about halfway up the continent uh, from north to south. So we're, uh, you know, 10 to 12 hours drive from Sydney uh, in Sydney's in the south. The University of Queensland has three main campuses. Uh, I sit on the, the largest and, and the sort of the, the head office campus, which is St. Lucia. It's about seven kilometers from the main CBD in Brisbane. And you can travel up the river on a, on a ferry to get to my campus. Uh, we have six faculties. I'm in the Faculty of Engineering, Architecture and Information Technology and more than 30 teaching and research sites plus some eight research institutes. We're a very big in the organization these days. Uh, there's more than 55,000 students enrolled in the University of Queensland. This year, there's been about 6,000 of them who can't come back to Australia to study because of the COVID-19 pandemic. So I've been teaching my classes like this lecture uh, to students who have been back in China, in Malaysia, Singapore, and in Indonesia, um, and even in the United States where students had to go home who were on a, uh, study abroad programs or exchange programs. So hopefully soon we'll see many of those international students get to come back to Australia and, and join us. Um, we have more than 7,000 staff and we've graduated more than you know, 280,000 students since we began as a university in 1911. So we're one of the oldest institutes in Australia. Um, we've been having a chemical engineering department also for more than 100 years. Um, so it's a, a long history of chemical engineering at the University of Queensland. We've got an exciting time at the moment because we're going to move into a brand new building in the middle of, in, in middle of 2021. Rankings were in the top, you know, 39 in terms of ranking of our scientific papers um, and always at the, you know, the last few years up in that top 50 to 60 institutes in the world. 
engineering at UQ is split into uh, several disciplines and our faculty includes architecture as well, who look at urban design as well as traditional architecture of buildings. Um, I sit in the School of Chemical Engineering, but we have a civil engineering school, mechanical and mining, uh, information technology and electrical engineering. And then we have two, uh, two research centers as part of our faculty, the Adverse Wa Advanced Water Management Center, and also the Center for Coal Seam Gas, which has recently been renamed the Center for Natural Gas. Um, and I also work in that center. In terms of the teaching programs we offer, um, we teach chemical engineering at master's and bachelor levels, but we have chemical and bioprocessing, chemical and biomedical, uh, environmental engineering, metallurgical engineering, sustainable energy, and urban water engineering. Uh, so we have quite a lot of programs at all levels, uh, from bachelor to master's level to PhD. We're a very research active universe, uh, school as well. We have more than 140 PhD students in our school. Uh, and that's amongst 37 uh, teaching and research academic staff. So we're, we have a very large school in terms of a chemical engineering school with lots of staff and lots of students. Our students in our, in my, in our research uh, students, PhDs come from, most of them are international students. Uh, about 80% of them are international students in chemical engineering in, in the research. It's the other way in our undergraduate degrees, it's about 80% students from Australia and 20% overseas. Um, in my own team, my students come and uh, my research team are coming from India, are coming from China, uh, from Malaysia, um, and some local students as well in, in previous years. I uh, also have a staff member from the Philippines. So we're a very international university. The University of Queensland already has many good links with Indonesia. Uh, we have more than, this is 2019 data, but there was 537 Indonesian students who were studying at UQ. Um, 13 of our academic staff, and that's out of a very big number, of course, but there's 13 academic staff born in Indonesia. Um, and many of our alumni, students who previously studied here, are now back in Indonesia. Um, so we have some, some partnerships already with the University of, uh, University of Indonesia uh, and some other smaller in, uh, part, uh, agreements with Indonesian universities. Just to show you a bit more about what it's like in Brisbane, where I, where I live and work, um, we've just come through our spring where we have all these wonderful purple jacaranda flowers blossom on campus. Um, we're based on a river and our campus has the river going around three sides of, of, of the, the campus. So it's a very beautiful place to work. Um, we're close to beaches and, and wildlife. Um, it's about an hour drive to the Gold Coast, which is one of the famous beach spots and, uh, and about an hour and a half to the, the places. This is the place where I grew up. It's called Malulabar. It's about 100 kilometers to the north of the campus. Um, so if you ever have a chance to visit Australia, it's a very beautiful place. Um, like Indonesia, we have many beautiful forests and we have beautiful uh, beaches and coastal areas as well. We have some of our own unique fauna, uh, like the koala, the sweet, sleepy koala that uh, sits in the trees. So if you ever have a chance to visit here, there's many uh, interesting things to see and enjoy. I'll move on to talking about some of my research. Uh, so I, I, I studied back a chemical engineering degree, and then I went and worked in the oil industry for uh, several years before my PhD. Uh, so I worked for, in an oil refinery for Shell before coming back to study um, ways to store energy, not in a liquid fuel like I've been making in the oil refinery, but in uh, for an electric vehicle. So for hydrogen storage or for supercapacitor electrodes, which are uh, uh, somewhere between a battery and a, and a fuel cell in terms of the power, how quickly they can get the energy out. So I worked on a lot of carbon materials that are porous carbons uh, that can store charge or they could store gas. Uh, my more recent projects include looking at CO2 capture and utilization. And we do experimental work, but we also do uh, techno-economic studies. So we can look at not just what's happening at a, a nanoscale on the catalyst surface, but how do we utilize that knowledge to build a whole uh, industrial complex so that we can evaluate the costs and the benefits of that process. Um, so we work across the range of scales, which is what chemical engineers do. Um, you know, we work from the very small scale at the catalyst interface all the way through to large oil and gas plants and petrochemical plants, and even through to thinking about um, 
even more complex systems of how those things operate inside the environment. So the particular part of my research I'm going to talk to you today is really focused at that interface between a catalyst, a gas, and a liquid. Um, and this is some work we published late last year on using um, some special solutions called reline solutions, and I'll tell you what they are in a minute, to produce highly selective catalysts to convert carbon dioxide into carbon monoxide in this case. So most of this work, uh, the laboratory work was done by my PhD student, Mr. Sahil Garg. Uh, Sahil is just about to submit his thesis. Typically a PhD in Australia in an engineering discipline or physical sciences takes around three and a half years. So Sahil is about to complete that now. Um, and then he's going to be moving across to Denmark to join the, Den uh, the Technical University of Denmark to start a postdoc over there in Europe. Uh, and the other key person in this work was Dr. Aaron Lee, who's a postdoctoral research fellow in my team. Our work's funded in this case by the Australian federal government, but also by HBIS Group. Um, HBIS Group, many of you may never have heard of, but it's one of the largest steel producers in the world. Um, from a Chinese company. So there's two big main steel producers in China. Uh, HBIS is one of them, and the other one is Bao Steel. So they're uh, the, within the top three terms of making tons of iron and steel. Um, I'll explain why a steel company is interested in carbon dioxide utilization in a minute. So the basic concept that we're looking at here is to convert waste gases that come from industry um, into useful products so that we can recycle that carbon back around the, uh, the, the economy or society. Uh, you might have heard the term circular economy. So this type of research is thinking about a circular economy of gases. So we take something that's been produced as a waste gas and we try to turn it back into something valuable. In doing so, we're also trying to prevent uh, the carbon dioxide emissions to the environment. Now, in this particular case, if we're going to use electricity to do it, that only really makes a lot of sense if we can get our electricity from renewables, from solar, hydrogen, or wind, uh, hydro as in water, uh, or wind. If we're having to burn fossil fuels, uh, coal or gas, to then make electricity to convert carbon dioxide back again, well, we don't get anything for free and there will be extra CO2 emissions. Um, so a lot of this technology I'm talking about is based on some future scenario, which might not be too far away, where we have cheap, renewable, green energy or electricity generation that can drive the chemical storage. One of the advantages of this then is that if you've got a, uh, an energy source like solar or wind that's intermittent, you get it during the day but not at night, or you have a windy day and then it's not so windy, you could use CO2 conversion to chemicals as a way to store some of that energy so that you can use it later. So the idea is that we take some CO2 source and it's emitted and there might be a little bit of separation, something to capture some CO2 and feed it through the electrolyzer. And the electrolyzer is just the word we use for reactor uh, when we're talking about an electrochemical reactor in which we supply electricity to it. If it's the opposite way, where we have a fuel cell, so we put some fuel to it and we get some electricity out, we'll call that a fuel cell. But in this case, we're using electrons to drive the reaction, so it's an electrolyzer. And we could convert that back to fuels like uh, methanol, propanol, uh, methane even, or we could convert it to chemicals. Uh, and the chemicals could be recycled back to industry. They could be used to make other products. This is the simplest form of this type of reactor, right? This is what we start with in the laboratory. So we have a glass cell. So these are just like beakers, but they have a connection in, connection in between them. Um, on one side, we have the anode chamber. And at the anode, there's oxygen uh, in the water. So, the, you know, H2O is split into oxygen and protons. And so we make the oxygen at the anode in this electrolyzer. For this project, that's not what we're interested in, but that's part of it that we must have to be able to supply electrons and get the charge to balance in our reactor. So that's on the left-hand side, the anode side. Most of the work that my team does is on the cathode side of this cell, but you've got to have the two half cells together to make it work. Um, and so at the cathode cell, we've got a, 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 an electrode that's got some catalyst on it. 
we call that the cathode or the working electrode. We might bubble CO2 or we saturate the liquid electrolyte with some carbon dioxide. Um, and then we do the reaction here where we produce uh, products that could be in the gas phase, like carbon monoxide, hydrogen, and methane, or uh, liquid products like methanol, ethanol, or formic acid. So this is the typical uh, cell that we have. We have electrons that flow from the anode across to the cathode. And we've got to have some charge then that flows across this membrane that's in the center of the cells to balance it out. So that charge would be in the form of uh, a cation or an anion, depending on the type of cell we're operating. So we've got electrons flowing and then we've got ions flowing in the system. The reactions happen at the surface of the electrode. And we'll look at more closely. Now, this can work at, uh, you know, we can split things, we can combine them and make new chemical, uh, new compounds in, and reactions in here. But one of the challenges is there's a lot of different reactions that can happen, all at about the same cell potential. So if you think of your traditional chemical engineering, you think of a reactor that's a thermocatalytic process. So you heat it up to make the reactions run. Right. So if you think about it, a certain temperature with a certain catalyst, there might be a lot of different reactions you can have. When we think about the electrochemical cell, the energy potential we think about is not the temperature so much, but it's the, the thermodynamic potential is related to the voltage we apply to the cell. So you can see from this chart that at a very small window of voltage, we can get lots of different reactions that happen. And so our challenge as electrochemical engineers is to try to control the system to produce the products we want. Um, it's no good producing all of these products at once because then it becomes really difficult to separate them to then be able to sell them to or, or use them as well, the products we want. So one of the key challenges here in this field is making selective catalysts. Catalysts that will use the electrons that I supply to the reactor to make the products I want. And so in my case, in this talk I'm going to give today, those products are carbon monoxide. I'll show you that even with good catalysts, we're still going to make some, sorry, I've zoomed on a bit. We're still gonna make some hydrogen. Um, we don't really wanna make hydrogen in this, this particular reactor. In some other electrolyzers, you want to split the water to make hydrogen, and then you're gonna use the hydrogen later on to store your energy and, and run a fuel cell, a car or something else, right? But in this particular thing, if we're trying to use our electrons to convert carbon dioxide, we don't want to waste them making hydrogen. So we want to engineer the catalyst to try to avoid that. Some of the things that we use in terms of, we call the metrics of electrochemical reactor performance. Um, we talk about Faradayk efficiency. Faradayk efficiency is the percentage of electrons we use to make the product we want. So it's like the selectivity for, uh, for a reaction. But in this, we use a special term in electrochemistry. Uh, we talk about the energy efficiency. That's the measure of the net energy consumption. Um, and we talk about current density and partial current density. So current density in electrochemistry is sort of like uh, the activity of your catalyst in a different uh, type of reactor. So it's giving you some indication of the rate of reaction that you can achieve. So the factors that affect the performance of my ECR, or electrochemical reactor, include I've got to have a catalyst and I need two catalysts in this case. I need one for each half cell. So at my anode, I need to oxidize the water to produce oxygen, but also set up the, the flow of uh, ions and electrons. And I can use a catalyst like iridium oxide or thinium oxide. For that side of the, the electrolyzer, there's lots of work going on in terms of oxygen evolution reactions. Um, and trying to find less expensive catalysts because iridium oxide and ruthenium oxide are very expensive materials to use as catalysts. On the cathode side, where my team works um, mostly, is you know we want to have something to reduce the carbon dioxide. So at the cathode, we're reducing the carbon dioxide. And we can use uh, catalysts like tin, silver, copper, or alloys of different things. And with these examples here, if I choose a catalyst like tin-based catalyst, I'll make a set, some set of products like formic acid. If I choose silver, uh, I'll tend to make carbon monoxide, um, which can then be used for syngas. If I choose copper, I might make methanol or methane or other hydrocarbons. 
So you can choose the catalyst material to help select the products you want to make. Another component of the electrochemical cell is the electrolyte. Um, and it has to be able to conduct ions. To be able to have the electrochemical reactions occur, you need to be able to conduct ions. The typical types of electro electrolytes we use um, are potassium bicarbonate, KHCO3, uh, sodium bicarbonate, um, and sort of aqueous solutions. We can also start to look at other types of solvents that you know, absorbs carbon dioxide, just like you would in a gas processing plant, such as uh, monoethylene amine solutions. Um, and in this particular work I'm going to talk about, we started with that idea of saying, well, if we can find a solvent that can capture CO2, can we then do the reaction in that solvent as well? Um, and then another aspect is around uh, the reactor design. Reactors here look very different to your conventional catalytic reactor that's, you know, a heterogeneous catalytic reactor. It looks a lot more like a fuel cell. And there's a small picture here. There's some commercial devices at pilot scale that might look about the size of uh, a shipping container or a truck. And of course, then things like temperature, pressure, and pH will affect the reaction. So these are all things we have to, factors we need to consider when designing an electrochemical reactor. The particular project we're looking at, um, because it's sponsored by a steel company, is looking for opportunities to convert the carbon dioxide that comes from iron and steel making. Um, so the average emissions of CO2 per tonne of steel produced is about 1.9 tonnes of CO2 per tonne of steel. And it's one of the biggest emitters outside power generation. Uh, so, you know, it's more than three, that's a big number, that 3,200 million tonnes of CO2 per year. Um, so if we could offset even just a very small amount of that from a steel mill from our, the company we work with, HBIS, or from other industries, um, even a really small amount, um, and this was at a conference I went to with them um, with about 200 people, offset a little bit of that emissions, we'd offset all the travel costs of people and their other costs for an annual uh, emissions. So we've got about 100 people in this room today. Um, if we could just capture 0.005% of the CO2 emissions from uh, the steel industry, that would set, offset all of our um, you know, combined emissions. Um, we'd probably get a few more people for Indonesia. I'm gonna push it up because Australia per capita has a very high emissions uh, level. Um, so we'd be able to offset some of that. If we could just get a little slice of this. Um, so it's a very big scale of problem. Even if we can just in an industrial process, like iron and steel manufacturing, if we can recover some of that CO2 and convert it to something else, sell it as a product or help reduce the cost of our process, then uh, you know, that could help to offset the cost of other investments in renewable energy or in uh, carbon capture and storage. So I think that at the current stage of this technology, it's really unrealistic to think about capturing all of the emissions from iron steel making. We're just looking for, can we do a little bit that can then be, uh, help take a step to remove some of that CO2 from that being emitted in the atmosphere. But there's a lot of challenges with this technology. Um, the kinetics of the reactions are slow. Um, we need to improve the energy efficiency. We need to improve this, the life of the catalyst. Uh, a lot of the literature in the published papers, you know, people run their reactor for eight or 10 hours. That's not long enough for an industrial process. We need to be able to run for tens of thousands of hours and still have high levels of performance. Um, and then the high costs of separating the products. So if you, can, if you can make a more selective catalyst, you can lower the cost of separation, but there'll still be some separating costs for recovering your products uh, and recycling CO2 that hasn't been converted. So the, the work I'm gonna talk about today looks very much at the surface of this uh, silver foil cathode in a solution called Reline. Um, and that's a choline chloride plus urea mix. And we can make a highly selective catalyst here. Um, and I'll explain why that one worked. So our approach here is to use this deep eutective solvent reline. Um, and it's got a long chemical formula there, but it's a combination of choline chloride plus urea. Um, this particular uh, solution 
has strong interactions with metals and metal oxides. And so we were looking to see if we could use that property to improve the performance of a silver foil catalyst for converting carbon dioxide to carbon monoxide. We started also by thinking about the uh, carbon dioxide has a good solubility in this type of uh, solvent as well. It has some other problems that I'll talk about in, later. It might, might not be useful. Okay, so again, we put it into this uh, type of cell. This is very similar to the process, uh, the, the schematic I showed earlier. And the type of data we get out of these reactions that we do in that electrochemical cell. The top left-hand plot A uh, shows the Faraday coefficient. So that's the cell activity of, towards carbon monoxide. So how many of the electrons that we supplied to the reactor went to making, converting CO2 to CO? And we can see here in different concentrations, uh, the blue one is 70% weight reline in water, and the red is 50 and the green is 60%. And the gray line is the benchmark electrolyte in this field, which is potassium bicarbonate. So we can get towards, uh, you know, very close to uh, more than 95%, I've been up to 96% conversion efficiency uh, selectivity towards carbon monoxide. The, the horizontal axis on these is the, is the potential. So we measure these at a, at a, across a range of potentials to see what the, the selectivity is like. And, you know, a plus B in this case, carbon monoxide to hydrogen will come out to about 100% efficiency in this case. Um, we're not making many, not making other products here. So we can see that, that it's a highly selective catalyst. Uh, the bottom charts D and E show the partial current density um, for carbon monoxide and the partial current density for hydrogen. So like I said before, this gives you some indication of the rate of reaction towards these. So these partial current densities in the reline are lower than in the benchmark catalyst. And a large reason for that is the reline is very viscous. Um, so that's one of the drawbacks of this technology and why it might not become the one that you use industrially. Even though it gives you some scientific insights, it might not be the best one to use commercially. Um, because it's highly viscous, the conductivity of ions in that fluid are, is, is much lower than in the potassium bicarbonate. And that means we don't get as high a reaction rate our part with our partial current density. Um, so to compare these results to others, uh, other work in the field with using silver foils, um, ours are the red dots. So, you know, we're at the top of the range here in terms of other materials. These are uh, performances in different electrolytes. Um, so this was interesting and significant work we're doing. And our question was, well, why, why does it work? Um, and particularly, why does it work at the low potentials? So the low potentials here mean the, the ones that are closer to zero. So the minus 0.08, minus uh, 0.9. The importance of that is that the energy requirement for doing the reaction is related to the voltage squared. So if we can reduce the energy, the voltage, then we can improve the energy efficiency. Well, when we started to look at these materials under the scanning electron microscope, we started with our fresh catalyst and we treated it in, after it had been treated in, in potassium bicarbonate or in, in reline, we see different structures. When it's in the reline, we start to see these uh, very different surface. Bicarbonate, it's like it's got little pits. So someone's just dug little holes. But after it's been used in the reline, so this is the spent catalyst, um, it's more like things that are sitting on top of the surface. So rather than pits that have been etched into the surface, we've got some growth of particles on the surface. And our hypothesis at, that we tested was that the silver starts with a layer of silver oxide. So if you take a piece of silver, if anyone's got a piece of silver jewelry, right, then you know, you'll find that it actually has a layer of silver oxide around the surface. Just like with, you know, uh, if you take some aluminum oxide, it has a layer of oxide on the surface, right? And when we put that in the reline solution, the reline, the urea and the choline chloride interact with the metal oxide and start to dissolve it. And they dissolve it, but then using the electrocurrent, we redeposit some of the silver. And what we get then is a highly active catalyst surface. So we looked at how much silver was left in the solution before and of the like before and after we did the treatment. And we looked at the surface area of the um, of the electrolyte. And so if you focus on the right-hand side of this figure, the one labeled D, we've got our fresh foil. 
this, this is the slope of this line represents uh, the surface area that's available. And if we have a higher surface area, we'll have a higher uh, number of active catalyst sites. So the fresh foil is the black one. If we just soaked it in our reline solution, there's been some interactions and it's increased. But then if we, after soaking it, apply a current or a voltage, we see this redeposition and we get a higher surface area again. I'm going to skip over this one um, and just give you this as a sort of towards the summary. What's happening at the surface here, right? So we have our catalyst surface. We have charges that attract to that surface when we're in the electrolyte. We put in some molecules, our choline chloride is this one with the quaternary N plus group in the center and our urea. And the way that these chemicals arrange at the electrode surface influences how they uh, perform as an electrode and how much of this restructuring you get. Um, so what we found is that by having these choline chloride layers here, we could change the way things interact at the surface um, because this choline chloride, the choline ion, is much bigger than the potassium hydroxide ion that would be in the normal benchmark electrolyte. The long chains on these groups also uh, affect the, how much uh, H plus we can have close to the electrolyte. That's important because if we reduce the concentrations of the protons at the surface, then we're less likely to make hydrogen. And that's why we can have a highly selective uh, carbon monoxide uh, catalyst in this case. We've also tested it in um, something that becomes a continuous reactor. So the picture on the right there, you know, is about the size of my mobile phone in terms of its area. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a squarer shape, but it's about that size. And it's probably three or four times as thick as my phone. That's our reactor. Now this only produces like, uh, treats a very small amount of carbon dioxide a day, but that's the sort of thing we're looking at when we're doing these experiments. Um, you can watch a video of us assembling and operating this type of reactor on the link there. And I've sent the, the slides to Hangara. So if he shares them, he's welcome to share them. People can have a look at that video later if you like. Um, so we're able to have a continuous operation of this, uh, this type of device as a different type of reactor to the, the initial H cell glass one. So this becomes a continuous operation um, and we can test it to see how long it lasts, how long, how stable it is. So, you know, we can run this for eight hours. We have other tests that I'm not showing today um, where we've run for more than two hour, 200 hours with a different type of catalyst and maintain performance. Yeah, so just to summarize this, I hope that it's given you some uh, insights into uh, a different type of technology that can be used for converting carbon dioxide to a, a chemical that in this case is towards CO4 syngas, which you can then use for a range of other things. CO is of interest also in the iron and steel making because you can recycle the carbon monoxide back to the blast furnace. If you can recycle some of your carbon in the iron making process, it means you don't bring in fresh coke or fresh coal. You can reduce a little bit of that. Um, so that's why it's also, uh, this particular reaction is important for our partners in the steel industry. So I'm going to finish there. Um, I know for many of you, particularly the students, there'll be lots of new things there. Um, so I hope I, uh, I haven't overwhelmed you. Um, but the main points to take away are, you know, that a carbon a CO2 conversion is possible using electrochemistry but you have to think about a catalyst, you have to think about your electrolyte, and you have to think about your reactor design and your operating conditions. And these are the same sort of things you would use in your more conventional or things you have to, factors you have to consider in more conventional uh, reaction engineering. It's just that this time we're doing them in an electrolyte um, rather than in, in say the gas phase or, the liquid, uh, or, or a pure liquid phase. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Tom, for your uh, very nice talk. So, uh, as Tom mentioned, uh, electrochemical carbon dioxide reduction is uh, one of uh, several promising strategies to mitigate the carbon dioxide emission. So, electrochemical processes operate at mild condition can be tuned to selective products, uh, allowing modular design provide opportunity to integrate uh, renewable electricity with 
uh, carbon dioxide reduction in carbon intensive manufacturing industries such as uh, iron and steel making. Uh, Tom also has described an engineering and design perspective. Yeah. So, uh, okay, Tom, thank you very much. Uh, now we come to the discussion section. Uh, here we have uh, received some questions from the audience. Uh, but before uh, showing them, actually, I have a small question <laughs> to you. So, uh, I'm I'm not specialist in these fields actually. I'm uh, primarily working with uh, photocatalytic and uh, photoelectrochemical water splitting. Now, as we know, besides the cathode, the anode also uh, important, right? So, um, actually, my question is: Can uh, oxygen evolution catalyst use use in uh, photoelectrochemical uh, water splitting, uh, for example, uh, be adopted for anode materials? Because um, here in our fields in photoelectrochemical wood splitting, we have, for example, like tantalum oxide uh, nitrides colloded with cobalt oxides, or uh, for example, bismuth vanadate colloded with um, cobalt uh, iron oxides or nickel iron oxides. So I mean, uh, uh, can um, yeah. the uh, yeah the common material that we use in uh, water splitting apply it in your field? I, I think that's that's certainly possible. I think it's one of the challenges then is to yeah. combine the two two half cells. Um, I, I guess yeah, you, to use the photoelectrochemical um, where you've got to have the light incident on your catalyst. Um, there's no no reason why that's not possible to engineer that into the cell. Um, is it easy? No, but I think I think that I would hope that uh, people could solve that problem. Yeah, I think it's a good it's a good suggestion. Um, I I don't know of anyone working directly on that. I do I, I I do know of people working on, you know, photo catalysts for the photo electro catalysts for the cathode side as well. But um, no, certain, no. certainly not yet. <laughs> yeah, certainly you know to combine the two cells is really important here. Um, yeah. We haven't, yeah. We're not working directly in the on the water splitting side. We kind of just take the the benchmark catalyst. Um, although my postdoc Aaron has worked on that uh, on 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 that side as well in other other studies. So yeah, we're always interested in what people are doing on the water splitter side, splitting side, <laughs> um, because it it's got a link together. I think the other the other uh, avenue for improving the combination is to look for uh, oxidation reactions other than water splitting. Um, mm -hmm. So, because you're using, you know, you're using a lot of the energy is going into splitting the water to produce yes, oxygen, yes. which you might not want. Um, yeah. So, if you can use a different oxidation reaction that occurs at a lower potential for that half cell, mm -hmm. um, you can have a big improvement in the energy efficiency. Um, so there's people that look at have published papers on gl glycerol oxidation, for example, as yeah, a, yeah, a model yeah. waste treatment. So if you can do something other than water splitting that's got a lower potential, that'll make a big improvement. Yeah, yeah, lower, <laughs> lower potential. Yeah, this is the yeah. uh, bottleneck. Okay, uh, co-host, uh, could you please show us the collected question? I'll, I'll st shall I stop sharing my screen for that? Yeah, there we go. Oh yeah. I think that's the yeah yeah the very nice question Agun because that's um that's just the comment I made, um so I think yeah if you can use the the anode side to do some oxidation of pollutants, um then that's 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 useful one because you're treating your um your pollutant problem but you're also lowering the cell potential, I think. The, the thing that we need to look at carefully with these systems is that whatever we're doing on the anode side isn't just producing as much CO2 as we're uh, consuming on the cathode side. Yeah, so yeah. looking at the overall CO2 balance is important. Mm -hmm. But I think that's a good question uh, that we can, we can work things together so that we can um, treat the, 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 a pollutant on the, on the anode side as well. The other, you know, I was talking with one of my students the other day about this. The other really challenging thing is the scale of this, right? Yeah. yeah. yeah this, the scale of CO2 emissions is just so huge that huge, yeah. um, many of our other pollutants in the water phase, the, the number of moles of those we have is, is much, much smaller. 
So mm-hmm. balancing the two uh, sides is, is a challenge to not from can the reaction work, but from a, is it technically and economically viable? So I think there's a, from our engineering and our scientific work here, there's really interesting questions around uh, the, the, you know, the scales as we go up. I see. So the scale up is also, also our challenge. Okay. Mm. Uh, can we move to the next one? Okay, this is in uh, Indonesian. So I, I, I'd like to uh, translate. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, the, the question is, um, th- this is about the effectiveness of um, your technology to uh, reduce the carbon dioxide in atmosphere. So as you mentioned, this is a huge problem, but to what extent uh, your technology uh, can 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 address the problem yeah i think this is just one of one of many solutions that are required um part of it the way i think about it is that if you can convert some of the co2 to a product that you can sell um one the company is making some uh getting some income from that to offset the cost um but it also might mean uh that you're not having to use fresh fossil fuels to make a product um and so it's, it's it can offset some of the intake of carbon into the into the production system but i think this is just the electrochemical co2 conversion is an important technology in the future but it's just one of many that will be required many changes yep. i see um, I... if the question if the question is about uh collecting co2 from the air and then converting it to i think that's an interesting question and how could you harness uh a co2 conversion technology that's not a plant um to passively capture some co2 um this technology it's possible if it was integrated with you know the right sort of renewables or perhaps even photocatalysts that you could do that um but i think it's a long way from it having Uh, an impact yet. There's many, many years to go. <laughs> okay, I hope this uh, answers your question. Uh, the next one. Uh, photocatalytic CO2 reduction. Uh, I, I don't really know. Um, I haven't followed the photocatalytic CO2 reduction uh, closely. Um, But I think, you know, th- th- there is work out there that's looking at this as well. Um, but I, I don't, know, um, don't know much about that side. Yeah, actually we are, uh, this is one of my students. Actually, we are working with carbon dioxide uh, reduction with water. Mm. But uh, we focus on the uh, developing the uh, photocatalyst itself so to turn the structure and then increase the specific surface area and so on. But yep. it's also still a long way. But at least we made some progress, <laughs> even though it's not that big. Okay, anyway. Yeah, uh, but it's a good question and good thinking uh, to look at how do, you, how do you look ahead. This is good. Okay, uh, move to the next one. Uh, high selective zero desire if increases specific self can um yeah so so i think this is a really good question about um the the what's important in the catalyst structure um so first i think it is the choosing the right class of catalyst and that depends on the type of uh product you want to produce um and then it comes down to yes the surface area is important um but it even comes down to the local electronic structure and the local uh, crystal structure because different uh, structures might um, have a different interaction with an intermediate so it's very complicated reaction engineering and um, and because uh, there's so many different compounds that or and, and intermediate species that can be involved in these reactions um But the seminal work in this in, on the, the reaction mechanisms is from a Japanese researcher, uh, Hori, H-O-R-I. 
Um, and it's at least 25 years old, that work. But there's some good work in this space if you're interested in it um, around the catalyst structure. So first choosing the catalyst type, which type of metals you have, and then what's the electronic structure and the crystal structure like. Um, I don't, I haven't looked at uh, the tantalate type catalysts. Um, the ruthenium and iridium tend to be on the anode side, not on the, on the um, cathode side. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Thank you very much. And uh, for my student, actually the uh, mechanism of carbon dioxide reduction is also uh, quite complicated. So um, quite a lot of people propose a little bit different mechanism, but uh, yeah. we are strict. <laughs> It's very complex. Okay, I, very I, complex. I struggle to keep up with it too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, thank you. Uh, the next one, if we still have. Okay, maybe uh, this is the last question that we okay. uh, have, I guess. So, <clears throat> Um, uh, finally, we come to the end of this lecture. We, uh, we would like to say thanks again to the guest lecture today, Professor Tom Raffles, for uh, sharing important information about carbon dioxide reduction technology. Uh, we also thank all the participants for joining our event today. We do hope that our international lecture series today will be useful for you all. Okay, I put my role back to Mizan. So Mizan, please. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hangara Sudurajit, PhD as moderator, and Professor Thomas Ruford as the speaker. Ladies and gentlemen, finally we get, sorry. Ladies and gentlemen, finally we get to the last session in this event that is closing. But before we end in this event, let's take some pictures together. For our <laughs> guests, may open the camera or start the video, please. Okay. One, two, three. <laughs> Again, one more time. One, two, three. Thank you. As the master of ceremony, we had like to give thanks to Professor Thomas Rafford as the speaker and Insinyur Boy Arifahari STMT PhD as head of chemical engineering department, engineering faculty, University of Jember, and the audience entirely. May what we had conducted will be useful for us in the future. If in guiding this event, we made mistakes of often someone here, please accept our apologies. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, thank, thank you again, Tom. See you next time. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Very nice to meet you. See you. See you. See you. See you.